Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be proving that non-empty finite subsets of ordered sets are bounded and contain their infimum and supremum. Now this problem is exercise 1.1.2 which can be found in your free online real analysis textbook and I'll leave a link in the description so you can check it out. Alright, so let's first list out the assumptions that we're going to be using throughout this proof. So first we're gonna let S be an ordered set and we're also gonna let A be a non-empty finite subset of S. So now we need to show that A is bounded and that A has an infimum and supremum and that A contains its supremum and infimum. That's a lot to show, but it turns out that we don't have to prove everything here. We can prove some parts and then those parts will imply other parts to this proof and make it easier. Okay, so how are we gonna structure this proof? Is this like a direct proof? Are we doing a proof by contradiction, a proof by induction? Well, the hint says we should be using induction, but that begs the question, what are we using induction on? Usually there's like some sort of natural number. And keep in mind in this textbook, a natural number is one, two, three, any positive integer. Usually zero is a natural number, but I won't get into that. So where's this natural number end then? What are we doing induction on? Well, a good strategy is to determine what object you're trying to characterize. What are you trying to describe? Are we trying to describe properties about S, properties about subsets in general? What are we trying to prove? Well, we're trying to prove something about the object A. And so that'll help you determine what to do induction on. Probably something about A. Now, if you're using induction on sets, a really good go-to natural number, especially if you're working with non-empty finite subsets, I highly recommend using induction on the size of that set A. So we know that the size of A is going to be finite, some natural number, one, two, three. And so there's a possible n that we can use mathematical induction on. So let's try that. Now before we start with mathematical induction, we should first figure out what our statement p of n is. Whenever we're using mathematical induction, we should probably address that first. So we're gonna let P of N be the statement if N is a natural number and the size of A is N, then A is bounded. Furthermore, the infimum of A exists and is in A and the supremum of A exists and is in A. Now I just wanna clarify something. We're not trying to prove that P of N is true by itself. Keep in mind, our assumptions in this proof are still right here. And so, the goal here is to prove that P of N is true, but by doing so, we're not necessarily proving that P of N is true, we're showing that our hypotheses imply that P of N is true. We're gonna prove that P of N is true right now using mathematical induction, but I just wanna clarify that P of N is not true by itself. Okay, so what's our base case? Well, just keep in mind that in this textbook, the natural numbers are positive, integers. So one, two, three, four, and so on, not including zero. But that doesn't even really matter because regardless, you have to start with n equals one in this problem. So we get to assume that the size of A is at least one. So let's take a look at when the set A has a size of one. Well, then we know something about A. We know a little bit more about A at least. We know that A has only one element. Now, do I know what that element is? No, but that doesn't matter because I can represent this unknown element as A1. Now, A1 is not the element, it's just a label for the element. I don't know what the element is, it could be who knows what, but it's an element and I have a label for it. That's all I really need for this proof. All right, so we have the base case set up. So now we need to make sure that the base case works. So in this specific instance, is it true that A is bounded, that the infimum of A exists, and that the infimum of A is inside of A, and that the supremum of A exists, and that A contains the supremum as well? Well, that's a lot to show, 
But luckily, we only have one element to work with. And this element happens to be the infimum and the supremum. And it happens to also be the element that bounds A both above and below. So notice that A1 is an element of A. And notice that A1 is less than or equal to A1. Now that seems like a redundant statement, but there's a lot to unpack here. Technically, this shows that A1 is both an upper bound and a lower bound to A. Now, why is that? I want to clarify. Well, A1 is an element of A, and it's also the only element in A, every element in A, in fact. And this element is above, greater than, or equal to every element in my set A. And so we can consider this A1 right here as an upper bound. So that's one way of framing this inequality, that every element in A is less than or equal to this element A1. You can also think about this differently, where this element represents every element in A, and this element is less than or equal to every single element in A, and so this is a lower bound. And so this inequality shows that A1 is an upper bound and a lower bound to A. Now that technically means that A is bounded. There's an upper bound to A and a lower bound to A, that means A is bounded. Now this technically doesn't mean that the infimum of A and the supremum of A exists, or that the supremum of A and the infimum of A is contained inside A. So we still need to prove those things. So let's pick an arbitrary lower bound. We'll call this lower bound X. So what does that mean about X? Well, then that means that X is less than or equal to every element in A. So, since A1 is an element of A, then X is less than or equal to A1. Now, since X was just an arbitrary lower bound, A1, regardless of what that arbitrary lower bound is, A1 is greater than or equal to that lower bound. That means that A1 is the greatest lower bound. So then the infimum of A equals A1. Now I do want to clarify, since A1 is an A, then the infimum of A is also an A because A1 is the infimum. So that means that the infimum of A exists and the infimum of A is in A. So let's do the same thing for the supremum of A. So let y be an upper bound. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean about y? Well, then y is greater than or equal to every element in A. Since A1 is an element in A, then A1 is less than or equal to y. Now again, y is an arbitrary upper bound of A, but regardless of what this arbitrary upper bound of A is, we know that A1 is less than or equal to that upper bound. A1 is an upper bound of A by assumption. A1, now remember that A1 is an upper bound of A. And so because A1 is an upper bound of A, and regardless of what upper bound I pick, A1 is less than or equal to that upper bound, that means that A1 is the least upper bound to A. So that means that A1 is the supremum of A, which means that the supremum of A is in A since A1 is in A. Okay, so let's summarize what we've shown. We've shown that if we have a set with just one element, this is the base case, keep that in mind, that A is bounded, that the infimum of A exists and is in A, and that the supremum of A exists and is in A. 
So we showed all of that. That means that P of N, the statement, is true for when N equals 1 here. But that's not the end of this proof. We still have to use mathematical induction. So let's do the inductive step. All right, so with this induction step, we're going to first let K be a fixed arbitrary natural number. So K in this case is a constant. I don't want you to think about it as a variable. Yes, it's a variable. But when I think about variables, I think about things that vary. This K does not vary. It's a fixed, random arbitrary. Who knows what it is? It could be any natural number. It could be 10. It could be 100. Who cares? It's arbitrary. And we're going to prove that if P of K is true, then P of K plus 1 is true regardless of what k is. It could be 10, it could be 100. Doesn't matter, p of k implies p of k plus one. That's the goal. So now we have instantiated k. k has been instantiated. k is a constant. It does not vary. So don't think about it as five and then it can turn to 10. Whatever it is, that's what it is. Right now, that's what it is. Sometimes I like to explain it like this. Think of K as like a curtain and that there's something behind that curtain. With constants, the thing behind the curtain doesn't change. With variables, the thing behind the curtain varies. That's why it's called a variable. That's how I think about it. So now we're gonna assume that P of K is true. But wait a minute, Cody, that sounds like you're assuming your conclusion inside of your proof, right? In mathematical induction, it often looks like that. And I totally get that. I totally understand that. But let me clarify. K is a constant. We're not showing, right? We're not assuming that P of K is true for all natural numbers, K. We're assuming that P of K is true for this specific constant, K. So it's not changing. We're only assuming one specific instance, P of K, is true. Just P of K. Not all of them, just P of K. Not P of 1 and P of 2 and P of 3 and P of, just P of K. Okay, so then what does that mean exactly? Well, we know what P of N is, so let's just substitute N with K. This is technically a function, and so whatever I put here is what I plug in for n. So then I could just take the statement p of n and just kind of fiddle with this a little bit. Okay, so this is the edited version. So if the app, so if the size of a equals k, this specific arbitrary constant, it's fixed, it exists, it's some constant, it was instantiated in this proof. So now we get to assume that if that condition is met, if the size of A is exactly K, then A is bounded, the infimum of A exists and is in A, and the supremum of A exists and is in A. Okay, so now let's take a look at a different set, B, where the size of B is k plus 1. The goal here is to show that B is bounded and that the infimum of B exists and is inside B and the supremum of B exists and is inside B. Okay, so we have a set B. Now, do we know anything about the set B? Well, it's ordered since it's a subset of an ordered set. That doesn't really give us that much information. We also know what the size of B is, so we can actually write out B. I'm going to try to be consistent and write little b1, little b2, all the way up to, to B sub K, and then B sub K plus 1. We're going to let beta be the set B1, B2, all the way up to BK, and we're going to stop it there. So then that just means that B is beta union, the set with just one element, B sub K plus one. Now this is gonna be useful for us because beta is a set of size 
k. And we know a lot about sets of size specifically k. We know a lot about those sets. And so we're going to use our inductive hypothesis with beta here. And then this set only has one element. And we know a lot about sets with one element because we proved a lot about sets with one element in our base case. So we're going to sort of utilize both of those resources inside of this proof to our advantage to prove that B is bounded and that the infimum of B exists and is contained inside B and that the supremum of B exists and is contained inside B. Now, since the size of beta is K, then the infimum of beta exists and the infimum of beta is contained inside beta and the supremum of beta exists and the supremum of beta is contained inside beta. Now that I know that, I can actually identify what the infimum and supremum of B is. Now that I know that the supremum of beta and the infimum of beta is contained inside beta. So what is the infimum and the supremum of B? Let's start with the infimum. So let L, which is going to be our infimum, we're going to show that, be the minimum between these two elements, the infimum of beta and B sub K plus one. Now L is contained inside B, but why? Well, since the infimum of beta is in beta and beta is a subset of B, then the infimum of beta is in B as well. And so the infimum of beta is in B and B of K plus one is in B, then no matter what, regardless of which element the minimum is here, that element is going to be inside B. So then L is in B. So now let's show that L is the greatest lower bound. First, let's show that L is a lower bound of B. So let's pick an element in B, an arbitrary element in B. So let's take B sub I, where B sub I is in B, and I is one or two or up to K or even K plus one. Because keep in mind, B right here is a collection of B sub one, B sub two, B sub three, all the way up to B sub K plus one. So if I pick an element in B, then I know what that element is gonna look like. It's gonna be B sub I, where I is some number, natural number, up to K plus one, including K plus one. Now, there are two possibilities about this element B sub I. The first possibility is that B sub I is in beta. Well, then that means that the infimum of beta is less than or equal to B sub I. Since the infimum of beta is a lower bound, then that means that it's less than or equal to every element in beta, including B sub I here. Now, since L is less than or equal to the infimum of beta, why is that? Well, keep in mind, L right here is the minimum of the infimum of beta or B sub K plus one. So why is this true? Well, if L is the infimum of beta, then that's definitely true. The infimum of beta is less than or equal to the infimum of beta. And if L is B sub K plus one, well, that means that the min here, that the actual min is B of K plus one, meaning that B of K plus one is less than or equal to the infimum of beta, which means that this is still true. So this means that L 
is a lower bound to B. Now I claim it's the greatest lower bound. Now to do that, I'm gonna pick a lower bound S, an arbitrary lower bound S, and I'm gonna show that that arbitrary lower bound S is at most as large as L. So let S be a lower bound of B. Now, since the infimum of beta is contained in B, and remember, that's because we proved that up here, that the infimum of beta is contained in beta, and beta is contained in B, and so the infimum of beta is in B. Now, S is a lower bound of B. And so that means S is less than or equal to every element in B. So including this element right here, the infimum of beta. Since the infimum of beta is in B, then S is less than or equal to the infimum of beta. Now since B sub K plus one is in B, and S is a lower bound of B, then that should be lowercase, and then S is less than or equal to B sub K plus one, two. So since S is less than or equal to B sub K plus one, and S is less than or equal to the infimum of beta, then S is definitely less than or equal to the minimum of the infimum of beta and B sub K plus one, which is L which implies that S is less than or equal to the lower bound L. Now S was an arbitrary lower bound of B, but regardless of what that arbitrary lower bound S is, that lower bound is less than or equal to L. And so since L is a lower bound, this means that L is the infimum of B. Now, we know that the infimum of B exists, but is the infimum of B inside of B? Well, we're trying to figure out if L is inside of B. Well, keep in mind earlier, we showed that L is contained in B. So that means B contains the infimum of B and that the infimum of B exists. Now that's great, we just found the infimum of B and we showed that it exists. And we showed that B contains its infimum. Now to prove that B has a supremum and contains its supremum, we just have to do the same thing we just did, but with the upper bound instead. And so we would flip the min to the max right here. I'll just make the changes here. Now I should clarify that technically I made one mistake here, that case two is right here. And so I didn't separate that from my case one, but that's okay, we can just kind of pretend like there aren't really any cases when there really are. So that does it, that's everything. That means that P of K implies that P of K plus one is true. And since k was arbitrary, that means that this is true for whichever value of k you plug in here. So we showed that p of 1 is true, so then p of 1 implies that p of 2 is true, so p of 2 is true. p of 2 implies p of 3 is true, so p of 3 is true as well. And so p of 4 is true. p of n is true for any natural number n because you can just go down this domino effect and eventually get to whatever natural number you pick for n. And so p of n is true for all natural numbers n. That's what we showed here. So then by mathematical induction, p of n is true for all natural numbers n. Now, I wanna clarify, we did not prove that p of n is true by itself for all natural numbers n. That is not the case. We did have assumptions in this proof, and I wanna remind everyone what those assumptions are before proving that P of N is true for all natural numbers. Those assumptions are, let S be an ordered set, and look at that grammar right there. And let A be a subset 
of s that's finite and non-empty that should be non-empty this is why you review your proofs this is why you double check everything it's always good and so if you see anything leave a comment and that'll help me out a lot thanks everyone that finishes this proof i'll see you all in the next video